Thank you so much to the amazing people who are behind putting together this great talk, um, or what I hope will be a great talk. <laughs> um, uh, uh, thank you all for being here in the middle of the day. Um, and um, and as mentioned a second ago, that um, today I'll be talking about the fact that objects can take you there. Um, that that if we allow them to take us there, they'll take us to spaces where we challenge assumptions, we actually are able to participate in a level of self-reflection um, and uh, public discourse and dialogue. Um, so um, my work, the work that I do is in, I have an ecosystem of practice. I'm an educator, I'm an administrator, I'm a curator. Um, and, um, and I work on curating experiences um, that really are about um, making institutions more publicly engaged, um, um, having them be the places that they desire to be and that they are structurally sometimes not prepared to be. And so oftentimes um, we kind of get in our own way. Um, and so the work that I have the benefit of doing with a host of other people wherever I feel like I have the privilege of working is centered in this idea that there is a user group we should be addressing. There is a public that we should be engaged in, and that that public is as dynamic as the objects that are in these institutions. Um, and, um, and that we also need to think of ourselves oftentimes as a part of that public. How do we actually participate in our daily lives in other spaces? So I work at this place. I work at the <laughs> Metropolitan Museum of Art, where we are one museum, um, three locations, the Met Fifth Avenue, the Met Breuer um, on um, Madison Avenue, um, and then the Met Cloisters. Um, that I affectionately call um, some people Upper Manhattan, um, some people the South Bronx, depending on who you are. Um, but the vision for this institution um, that was created or rewritten a few years ago was that we would create the most dynamic and inspiring art museum in the world. I'm sure the Yale University Art Gallery feels the same way about their vision for themselves. I feel that way as a human being. I want to be the most dynamic and inspiring individual in the world. Um, and so it's a lot, it allows for a lot of room to kind of have space to spread your wings. Um, the, um, the museum this year, or last year, actually saw 7.4 million visitors. And I'm giving you this information for a reason. I mean, there's a, there's a rationale for why I'm sharing stats with a group in the middle of the day. Um, one third of the people that had come to this museum, contrary to what I ever thought, um, fit between the ages of 18 and 35. Is that the image you have at the Met? Okay, so below 35, so if we were to say anyone below the age of 35, that takes that number up to about 42%. So almost half of the people that come to this institution don't look like what is deemed the stereotype of its museum visitor. Um, public programs, education, live arts is responsible for 11% of that 7.4 million people. So people come directly through the doors to experience something that the department I get to work with and in actually has developed. So I would say that the stakes are high for how we behave, how we practice, what we do. 39,000 programs is what we offered last year. Now I should qualify that, that includes all the tours, but if I take the tours out, there's hundreds of thousands of programs that we offer or not hundreds of thousands, but thousands of programs that we offer every year, which seems to be, a, it's a lot because of the scale and scope. These are just some other, so a little bit of information that I think might be helpful for the context of this talk. So when I talk about Met education, we're talking about a place that we have started to think about as an active laboratory of art and ideas, rather than a place that really is like, we are knowledge brokers, we actually, have information, we're sharing with, with the public, they've come to us to learn a specific set of things. We obviously still share information, we actually do see ourselves as extremely knowledgeable, but we also are thinking about the kinds of knowledge we share, how we share it, and how that knowledge might land with the public. And also figuring out 
What is it that the public is actually interested in? What is relevant to them? And so I have spent my entire career thinking about this question. <laughs> How can I make museums irresistible? How can I make people like fall in love with these places? How can I treat a museum like folks are in a relationship with it? You know, so is it like a, are we talking speed dating? Are we talking, so it's like one minute? Or are we talking about, you know, um, serial monogamy? Are we talking about, you know, mischievous relationships? Are we talking about marriages? What are we talking about here? And so I'm constantly trying to figure out in the most loving relationships that I have ever seen, there's an exchange. There's a level of relevance that exists there. Like I care that I care about what you think. I'm considering you. And so the answer to my question is we have to think about relevance. And so James Cuno once said that if a museum is to be a marketplace place of ideas, it should stimulate debate and visitors should be heard and not just seen. And so here is an opportunity for us to think about what is the function of these spaces. So we've been thinking about this a lot and we've been thinking about what are some of the various pathways to get to these. Um, and so those attendance figures make me feel like we actually um, have to be extremely responsible in a space where we're not you know, fighting to get people into the building. There are lots of people that, we, that don't necessarily come to the Met that we need to figure out how to make them like us, how to like, have people in communi community with us, but also not have them necessarily come to the museum, but us go to them. Um, the final thing I would say about that is this pathways, like there are many different pathways to getting there. And so the museum is about, is, for, is 149 years old now. I know, right? Next year, 2020, apropos, looking back, looking at the future, we could be Sankofa about it, look to the past to understand our future. Um, the museum, hindsight is 2020, you know, we can go on. Um, the museum will be 150 years old. So in that time, there has been a reoccurring theme. And it is that we have always sought to be more than just a treasury of art. Now, I don't know that everyone thinks that, that we are not just a place that is the custodian or, or holders of objects. But it's the truth. The museum has always kind of looked at its museum in a much more complicated way than that. So it's not simply to exhibit the visual achievements of all cultures, but to demonstrate to, the, to a wide and diverse audience or to a wide and diverse group of users why these objects are relevant to their lives. So when we talk about it, we've been talking about like not just being a museum of the world, which is the way people think about encyclopedic institutions, but a museum that is in the world, participating actively in its existing framework, where anyone can find their place, where we aim to connect people to creativity, knowledge, and ideas, and create new connections, knowledge, and ideas in the space, that the museum could be an extension of anyone's everyday practice, that they can come as a part of their daily walk, that it is a part of their experimental space for artists, for other practitioners. So one of the things that I think about in terms of like these pathways is let's just talk about young people. And so let me begin by saying that we are living through very dangerous times. Everyone in this room is in one way or another aware of that. We are in a revolutionary situation, no matter how unpopular that word has become in this country, the society in which we live is desperately menaced. People are at odds with each other. To any citizen of this country who figures himself to be a responsible, and particularly those of you who deal with the hearts and minds of young people, they must be prepared to go for broke. Or to put it another way, they must understand that, at, that in the attempt 
to correct so many generations of bad faith and cruelty when it is operating not only in the classroom but in society, you will be met with the most fantastic, most brutal, and most determined resistance. There is no point in pretending that this won't happen. The paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. This institution is fostering this kind of criticality, right? So the purpose of education is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself, herself, their self, to make their own decisions, to say no, to, him, to say to himself, this is black or this is white or somewhere in between, or to decide for themselves that there's a God in heaven or not, whatever the framework is. So I know this must sound interesting and kind of, but there's no society really anxious to have those kinds of rigorous thinkers around, ironically. I, must this, I, I think this, when I, when I read this part of my talk, um, sometimes people are like, oh wow, she sounds so deep, so thoughtful, so interesting. But I must tell you, I can't take credit for these words. These are the words of James Baldwin that were spoken before I was even born. And what's challenging about this is that I could read these today and people think they're as relevant as they were in 1968-9 when he shared this in a talk to teachers. So if you haven't read this very amazing long speech, it's called A Talk to Teachers, um, and you should read it because it is painfully, pain it was 63 actually, and it's painfully relevant today. Um, and so while these words were spoken well you know, beyond my years, um, the unfortunate thing is that this is a moment where you read something like that and timelessness becomes a bad thing. You know, timelessness is usually a good thing when it comes to style, when it comes to fashion, when it comes to artwork. That's a timeless work of art. But when it comes to these words, it seems so like problematic that something so painfully um, kind of interrogative of our time um, could still be relevant all these years later. So I'm always thinking about, in a museum, how can we actually get away from those kinds of um, or repeating something like that or having it be relevant again? And so we think about these pathways that I was mentioning earlier. And in museums, uh, we pride ourselves on being object-based, teaching from the object, which is I am all for. But this, the idea of letting an object take you there means that you might think about a level of intersectionality. One might think about how things come together, where things overlap. And so I show this because, you know, one might enter into these conversations through the lens of history, and that's a usual thing we do in galleries. One might think of having these conversations through the lens of interest. I'm interested in sports, so let me show you some images about sports. One might enter into conversations with young people or the general public about, you know, you know the, 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 the history of the world or how cultures intersect. But I think this moment in time, when I think about Baldwin's words or I think about kind of what's happening in society right now, there's a place for museums to actually set up camp in the hearts and minds of people because what's happening outside of our doors completely intersects what's happening in the objects, in the collections, and in exhibitions. And so it really calls into play people's lived experiences which oftentimes haven't been honored in our dialogues and galleries. And so when people ask me, how, do you, how, how can we make people fall in love with museums? How do we make museums irresistible? How, and, the, and the answer I always say is relevant, but it's relevance, but it's also more pointedly about what people are interested in. So I tell people all the time, oh my goodness, I actually, um, uh, love going to movies. I'm the person that goes to a, a movie and I will stand in front of the kiosk and I'll say, okay, it's 120, what's playing? Okay, that seems interesting. And I'll go. My husband, on the other hand, is like, we shouldn't go if there's not something we are interested in. So 
But there was a movie, Snakes on the Plane. Do you remember that? Snakes on the Plane with Samuel Jackson. And I was just like, There's, you can't pay me to go see this. Um, and they advertised to me. They advertised to us. I mean, every bus stop I was at, it was everywhere. It was on the side of buses. It was like coming up in different feeds and places. And, um, and I literally was like, I'm just not interested. And the reason I also go to see movies um, in that way that I do is because I feel like I can't talk about something or have an um, opinion about something that I haven't seen, except with snakes on a plane. So I never saw it. And they, they and, and it was truly because I just was not interested, right? And so how do we actually find out what people are interested in, find out what's in our collections, find out where some real issues are happening so that it actually has a sense of urgency for people? So this is what this is about. And so we actually are investing a lot of energy and time into understanding youth voice and choice. And I would even say, you could take out Youth Voice and Choice and add, um, sorry, my screen just went black, um, and add, um, add in um, Audience Voice and Choice or User Voice and Choice. Um, and so I'm just going to quickly breeze through these slides because I think it's important to see some really beautiful pictures and you can see people actively engaging in the museum space. Um, and so we started a program called um, Teens Take the Met where on one Friday, two Friday nights a year, um, uh, for three hours, about four to 5,000 teenagers show up at the Met. And it's amazing. And it's while the museum is open, and so there's upwards of 20,000 plus people in the building at the time. And when we started this program four and a half years ago, the museum said they hadn't seen lines like that for anything at the Met since the, Steve Mc since the um, Alexander McQueen show. And I was like, this is amazing. So I'm just going to flip through these pictures because what we try to do is create a space for youth to live out loud. In fact, over the past decade, communities across the country have come to understand that out of school time spaces are super important, that are teen centered, where young people are able to make decisions about the world that they live in, the places that they can be involved with. Um, these are organized by 40 plus oftentimes community partners. Um, they are, um, you can do 3D printing, you can take a dance class with Alvin Ailey, all connected to the museum's collection. So when you see the dancing happening in the galleries, you will see that they're actually responding to works of art. You can write a one minute play with a youth organization that does plays, but they're in reaction to your own ideas or in reaction to objects in the collection. Um, and so this is, We'll just, I'll just keep flowing through these. This is important because what we understand is that arts-rich programming and learning environments foster these kinds of, um, or reinforce the social connections and promote pot of sc positive school culture and change, and also help young people be able to express their ideas more effectively. Students participating in visual arts integrated programming are more likely than their peers to be um, intentional in their decision making, and they also approach problems with patience and persistence. Arts integrated programming, when students are involved in them, they, they demonstrate an increased motivation to persist beyond a challenge despite anything that sits in their way. They have an improved ability to actually focus in more intentional ways, and they are mo motivated to continue learning about a particular subject matter more so than their counterparts that are not participating in the arts. They are taking over the museum, literally. <laughs> and this is happening while the public is walking by, watching them, asking them questions, um, and so this idea of young people being able to have a level of agency, but underneath this surface of play and experimentation is a covert curriculum that we know about, that we've designed based on research, based on conversations, based on collaboration with them. And so the idea that young people could consume visual culture 
through other disciplines in this space or adjacent to it is something that we really want to promote because it means that they're doing it on their own terms. In some cases, we invite artists like Fred Wilson to come and do a writing workshop in advance of Teens Take the Met so that the students actually are performing the work on the night of Teens Take the Met. This is in the, um, the Congo exhibition. I don't know what that is. You can, you can stop that. I'll stop that. That was supposed to come out at the beginning. Um, so the, the, the other thing that I think is important is that I really am a firm believer that museums are places where we can ignite discussions or we can actually tap into discussions that are already happening, but people are having in other recesses of their lives. And so it's a lower barrier to having people come together that are nothing like each other to be able to have concrete and distinct conversations um, that actually might change their thinking. And so you all know um, kind of the terror that's happened um, where there was a mass shooting and, um, and it's been really challenging for a lot of people to talk about the kinds of challenges that come along with being able to speak publicly about some of these images. Um, and so students have been experiencing certain things in their schools where there's been lots of loss of life. Um, and this has been happening over the years, but over the last few years, young people have said, we're gonna speak up about it. We're going to have conversations. So I'm actually gonna, through the rest of this presentation, there are gonna be some images that will be disturbing, but I think that they're helpful and insightful for the kinds of conversations that I think we, that I know we can have in museums. Um, and so, my husband and I started raising our um, now 10-year-old cousin a year ago. Her mom was not, not, not feeling well or not well, and, um, and so we started raising her. And she is amazing. You'll see her in a second. Her name is Carly. And um, so soon after she came to live with us, you know, she'd come to the museum with me. We'd walk through the museum, and, you know, I just didn't think anything of it. And so I would take her through the bottom of the museum. On the, at the Met, we have this tunnel where you can go through the bottom of the museum, and there's, like, all these old pictures and things like that. And on this day, I said, why don't you just, let's, let's walk through the galleries. So I work above, my office is above um, Greek and Roman and, um, and, Africa, Oceania, the Americas. And so I literally, on this night, on, the museum was closing, um, it was closed, um, and so I had to walk through from literally four blocks, from 80th Street to 84th Street inside. Um, and so we walked through, and I thought it would be interesting, and she had just kind of come to live with us maybe a couple of months ahead of that. And so we're walking through, and she's like, oh, this is so interesting. It's kind of like night at the museum for her, and I'm like, I don't, always scared walking through the galleries at this hour. And I said, so how was school today? She said, oh, we had active shooter training. She said we'd had active shooter training. And I said, oh, really? What did that look like? She said, well, you know, we, you know, they told us what to do. We got on the floor. They told us to, you know, um, run, fight, hide. Um, I mean, run, hide, fight. Um, they told, she's at the time nine years old. I was like, wow, this is, so we walk through the galleries and we're passing through the medieval court. We're, we just keep going. We go through, you know, Greek and, I mean, we, we passed through, um, we had passed through Greek and Roman already. We keep going, keep going, keep going. And then we get to this space. And she says, T.T. Sand, this is what we need. I'm going to say that one more time. She was talking earlier about active shooter training. We get to these galleries. We walk through three and a half blocks of galleries, and we get here, and she says, T.T. Sin, with the brightest smile on her face, nine years old, this is what we need. And I said, oh. And I did exactly what someone said. Someone, I, was, I laughed a little. I chuckled, like, thinking, Haha. And then when I really heard what she was saying, I was like, oh. Really? Wow. She's like, yeah, it'd be cool. Like we could actually like put it on and, and 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 we could make it like clear and invisible and no one could see it. And we can like be armored. Like the see the horses don't even get she's going on and on and on. And I said, 
wow. So I started using that in my teaching, talking to people about the fact that like, I had never seen these objects in this light. So fast forward, I start talking with other people about like, oh yeah, you know, um, you know they make backpacks, bulletproof backpacks now for kids. And I'm, wow, there's an entire industry being created around this, right? So we start having these conversations and I thought, wow, I even just needed to open my mind up a little bit and let the objects take me there a little bit. So we started having these smaller group discussions. Um, and then our live art, then, then we realized that, oh wow, young people at the same time were rising up, taking over Washington. They were doing all these things. And they were saying, never again. And then they were on the cover of magazines. And then you start to see the real truth of it. People actually, their bodies being shown, right? Where young people are like, okay, yeah, I, photograph me. And then you hear them say, fun arts, not the NRA. These are young people. And then we said, what if we worked with young people and brought them into the collection and maybe in Arms and Armor, they can actually bring a little bit of themselves. And so I'm going to play this video for you. Um, this is my little person on, the, on your right, Carlissa. That's Naomi on the left. We have a program called Hashtag Met Kids. So she went from saying this thing, all these things were happening in the world, and then she gets to participate in a conversation about the very Arms and Armor that she actually was calling into question here. Do I just click? My name is Carla Sai. And my name is Naomi. And we're here to talk to the dancers from It's Showtime and NYC. I'm Wildcard. I'm the Administrative Associate Director. I'm Classic, spelled with a K, and I'm one of the dancers. And I'm Flex, with two X's, and I am the Artistic Associate Director of It Showtime NYC. What inspired you to start dancing? I started out wanting to be like Michael Jackson, and then eventually I realized how cool everyone thought I was because I danced, so I used it to step out of my shyness. My dancing came from exploration and being creative and being able to express myself. When I first started dancing, I just wanted to be somebody different. I met my mentor. She was able to really push me to actually take dancing seriously. Dancing was able to bring me here. What are the types of dancing you do? My main style of dance would be flexing, which is a reggae dance hall based style that was created in Brooklyn. A lot of inspiration came from where we are, like our neighborhoods. We, we are born in hip hop. How was your experience dancing in the armor? A lot of us thought that certain pieces of armor were going to be hindering towards our natural movement, but we actually found out that they were able to give us a lot more room to move around as dancers. It was definitely like an experience dealing with the chainmail because of the heaviness of it. But at the same time, it, it accents my movement that I already do. So it's a give and take. How do you challenge someone to a dance battle? And how do you think of it being similar? Similar to the battle in the old times. When I'm challenging someone to battle, I'm coming straight for it towards them. All my focus and my energy is on them. And I'm really trying my best to intimidate them for a win. So there's a lot of preparation that went into battles back then, as much as dance battles now. What are the different types of clothes that you wear for your dance style? And what kind of music are you going to use? If you don't wear the right armor in the right places, then you're going to lose that fight. What inspired you guys to dance? So this dancing activity that I was a part of during school every week, that brought me out of my shell. <laughs> so they are adorable. Um, but one of the things that I think is the undercurrent of this is that those dancers have been with us for almost a year. 
and they spend excessive amount of time with the curators, um, with our colleagues in education, but also with the public. And so there's an entire um, narrative that they've created. And so at the beginning of the performance, they have an, an, like an, a, a beautiful narration and monologue about the history of these works of art in the collection. They're still performing if you want to come see them. I want to move on really quickly to a couple of other things. One is this notion of challenging assumptions. So this idea of challenging assumptions is super important. Um, uh, I don't necessarily believe that there are any safe places in the world. I think there are safer places, and I think the museum is an amazing place for those kinds of, um, for people to have safer um, dialogues. Um, as you can tell, I'm a Baldwin fan, and he says that the role of art is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. And so I think that that also becomes the role of a museum to kind of participate in that way. Um, and then, you know, Nina Simone says that the artist's duty, as far as she's concerned, is to reflect the times. This isn't everyone's cup of tea. But in this moment right now, more and more museums are thinking about how we can actually be spaces for those kinds of discussions to take place, for any kind of discussion to take place. Um, uh, I was going to show you this um, video of Julie Moretu, who makes us, and I will, um, makes us look at an object completely differently um, than, say, one might have looked at it historically. Um, and so this is Julie Moretu My as name a part is of Julie our artist Moretu, project. And I'm a painter. There are certain paintings that stand out in a gallery that call you to them. Even with all the other Velasquez works in that room, this was one of the paintings that has always haunted me. It's a big marker for me here in the night. It's a portrait. So I went back and looked up some of the narratives around this painting, one being that Velasquez spent a few years in Rome preparing to make the portrait of Innocent X, and Juan de Pereo de Velasquez at the time was with him. He was one of his primary assistants, and he was his slave. I read this room, and I was thinking, how do you paint your slave? You know, American slave narrative is very different, but this is a person who did not have his rights to himself. There's such irony in that setup. The fact that Velasquez could capture the complex emotion that comes from his own position as the owner of this person and what that denies that person. He's standing there very proud, dignified. The slipping of his hand under his shawl pulls you to that part of him, just under his heart the hair falls back into the background and gives the illumination of the face and this radiance. When you come up close to it and you look at the way the brush strokes articulate the lace on the shawl is just incredible. I get goosebumps. It's this gentleness of the brush on his face, articulating his mouth, his lips, his nostrils. He's almost holding a breath. You feel like you're encountering a real human being. To be able to capture the complete humanity of someone you think of as not completely human in the same level as you. There's an incredible contradiction there that blows my mind, actually. Think of the political implications of painting a black man with copper skin and brown eyes, and then the piercing look. It's not contempt. I don't read it as rageful or angry. And it's not resignation, but this very conflicted, implicit sadness in that human being described within that dignity. There's honor in being painted by someone such as if you want to see the rest of it, you should go to um, the Artist Project at the Met. There are 120 of these artists on works of art, not their own art. Um, it's a great teaching tool. It's fantastic. It is the highly opinionated perspective of someone who is willing to share about a work of art, but also has a, a, um, a level of depth of knowledge about the aesthetic qualities about the objects. So it's a different perspective. Um, it's almost the user's perspective. Um, and we have a program in the galleries called Artists on Artwork, where you can come and hear someone like Julie Moretu in front of a work of art of her choice. Um, the next object, the next thing I wanted to talk with you about is kind of similar to that. Like, how do we actually have works of art have varied legibility? How do we actually look at them through a prism, if you will? or a kaleidoscope. And so this is Carrie James Marshall's. I wanted you to see it from afar. How many of you have seen this work before? 
So this, this work is um, super important to me because I feel like every institution I've worked at literally has had this on view at some point. Um, and um, so I've taught from it a great deal or I've watched people teach from it. And, um, and so this is called Heirlooms and Accessories and it's from 2002. And this is the object all the way in the back of the room. And so you can see the scale of it. It's, it's not small um, and it's, this is it up close. You can kind of see that there's a shadow image there. Can you see that um, in the background beyond the necklace here? Um, and so it's, uh, I'm going to show you the source image and then I'm going to come back to this image because the source image is very painful. And so these three images of these women, this lovely, gorgeous, very beautiful um, painting that has stones all around, not painting, photograph that has stones all around it. It's a triptych as you saw from across the room. Um, and these women are in a crowd. This is the crowd. So this is the source image. And they're looking directly into the camera. You know, one thing I never noticed um, until recently was this beautiful little loving gesture here where they're at an event. You see that? It's like they're, they're on a date, if you will. And this was common. So these used to be, you know, backed and people would mail these to family members showing that they were there. And so what Carrie has done is tried to create a different kind of point of entry into an, 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 a historical narrative that is so painful that if he could just create a lower barrier to entry, we might open up into the kinds of conversations that people reserve for their kitchen tables, but in a public space. Does that make sense? That the museum becomes the place where you could actually have those kinds of discussions with people that you may not be totally familiar with. Why something like this would happen? Why someone would take pride in something like this? Why this would be considered an heirloom? That photograph, that moment in time being something super special that you were there, that you would look directly into, your gaze would be directly into the camera. And then so if I fast forward past this, when we recently started having these conversations with young people, um, and we had the Carrie James Marshall exhibition up recently. Recently, one of the teen, one of the teenagers, and then a college student said, "Oh, this reminds me of Eric Gardner." Eric Gardner being the man from Staten Island in um, 2014 that people said that he was like lynched. Now, whatever your politics are, whatever your opinions are, anything like that, this is the conversation that the work took us to, right? So we're in the space. And the dialogue ends up going to this place where people are talking about something that we don't even believe happens anymore. It would be it's crazy that something like this would happen. That this man in public was choked in a chokehold that's illegal and says, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, and, and is, ends up losing his life. So they're equating this very historic image that is, and this whole discussion is happening because we have a work of art by Carrie James Marshall. So the thing that I'm so hell-bent on in museums is making sure that not only do we say these are great places and important places to have these or appropriate places for us to have these discussions, but we have staff that are, and colleagues that are super prepared to have these discussions. Um, and so then that took us to conversations about Black Lives Matter. I'm gonna show you this, this video, two seconds of it, because this is a young woman who was in one of our school programs, and we were trying to figure out, like, what is the difference um, that, what is the different experience that young people are having in their classroom that they aren't necessarily, ha that they are having in the museum, or vice versa, that they're having a different experience. What's unique about the museum experience for students, in their own words? And so the, um, this young person records in her journal, her video journal, kind of the specific difference between a museum experience and the experience in her classroom. Um, and I think I'm supposed to play. Can you play it for me, sir? Art? If you can't, I'll just move on. 
like I remember when we were doing race and gender and we looked at a John Brown piece and it was like a classroom but outside the classroom you know we were having class discussions but outside the school environment you know and it was easier and was more engaging because it was like a comfortable environment where we could say what we wanted without feeling probably not feeling like it was wrong because this is what you thought about the piece and up until our last visit we got to choose um, what gallery we wanted to go to and it was like seeing all these different cultures come together from different time periods and seeing how they lived and we got to sit and at the piece that stood out most to us and we got to write how this connected to our lives. And if it was last year, I would have thought that art connected to our daily lives and that it connected to how society thinks, you know. Uh, I've gotten so much engaged into this museum, to the Met Museum and its work, that I've decided to do an internship in the summer. <laughs> This is her recording in her own apartment, I mean, at home. So we don't dictate anything. And so for me, I'm like, this kind of sums it up in many ways, like why this is an imperative space for these kinds of experiences to happen. I'm going to end by telling you a little a story about, of self-reflection. Um, and then I'm going to try and do this in like five minutes, five, 10 minutes, which is what we have left. It's about this little girl, which is me. That's where you say, oh. <laughs> so this is me when I was about Carlissa's age, um, my little cousin. Um, and I was really interested in what it means to be cool. So I, and, and I realized that across time, that is all I've ever really been interested in. You had to be there moments, and that is really cool. Not cool in a really surface sense, but cool in the way that, you know, they're all these different, it's, it's cool actually cuts across time. It's timeless, as I was mentioning, like this is the good timelessness, right? Um, and so um, over the years, I've kind of collected all these words that mean cool. So cool, and then there was like this moment in like early 2000 where college students were like, oh, that's copacetic. Um, and then I grew up with that's dope or that's sweet or fly. Um, my brother says that's 100, like meaning that's 100%, not 100, but 100. Um, he also says, you know, oh, that's a dime, meaning that's like a 10. Um, there was this moment where young people said things were swag, um, uh, that's hot on fleek. Um, now that's, there's this like, oh, that's everything. Uh, am I wrong? I'm right, right? I'm right. That's everything. But my little cousin told me the word now is that's satisfying. Oh, that's so satisfying from a 10 year old. I'm like, that's okay. Okay. I guess that's what my mom felt when I said that's dope or whatever. Um, and so I've always been captivated by things that were cool, things that were really. Uh, I guess cool is stand in for interesting, compelling, dynamic. I want to be that. I want to be around that. I want some of that. And so um, over the years, I've started to track some of these things. And I, as a child, was very interested in how cool Miss Piggy was. She was fascinating. She was stylish. Did you know that her clothing was like designed by actual designers? She was amazing, and she was kind of weird, though, because she would do anything for this green dude. I mean, she loved him. She thought, I mean, you know, they would, they would go to these balls and dances, and people's heads would fly off in the Muppet Show. Like, all kinds of things would happen. But she would be, like, almost frantic in the weirdest way where I got to the point where I was like, no, Miss Piggy's not that cool. Then I became very obsessed with this person, Wonder Woman. Like, she is amazing. Like, wow. Until I 
you know, became an academic and realized, oh, it's based on an image of a pinup, and oh my God, this hypersexualized, and blah, 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 all this stuff. But I was really interested when I was younger in the fact that she was so cool because she had certain things, like she could like ward off bullets and do all kinds of stuff. She had these superpowers. She could get into your head. Um, she had a belt that actually could make people tell the truth. And then the most amazing thing is that she was from a community of um, interesting, tall, shapely, amazing women that were, had height and depth and all kinds of things. But they were, they were a major community, that community of Amazons. Do you guys remember any of this? I'm dating myself for people that you know, may not fit into my age demographic, but if you haven't seen this, you have to go see it. Um, but she had this amazing plane that no one seems to talk about, like the very transparent plane. And then you see the guy, there's always like some person like laying flat on the bed of the plane, and she's like taking them to get the truth out of them so she could save the world, right? So these were all images that were set up in my mental framework. So one day someone asked me two questions, one of which was, do you remember the first artist that you ever saw? And I was like, what kind of artist? Oh, visual artist. Oh, that was J.J. Evans on Good Times. The first time I knew like, that I saw a black artist, that I knew that this was a profession, it was a field, he had a card line. His family was much more like mine than any other like visual representation I'd ever seen relevance. That I cared, they were like me, some kind of connective tissue. My life entered the discussion. You see where I'm going with this, that bubbles? Like grit, this is where the intersectionality started to happen. He had a highly politicized family. They cared about the world. They, were, they cared about their community. And so I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, he had a sister who was also in the theater. Um, but I also did some research and found out that Ernie Barnes, the visual artist who actually painted these amazing paintings, was also, he was an athlete and a visual artist. And that he actually painted these images, this is the rent party, where they actually reflected community issues, right? But I'm seeing this on the television screen. I'm not seeing this in a museum. And I grew up in San Francisco in the Fillmore, a very particular place where we had Diego Rivero's as murals on the walls, I mean murals in the streets near our train stations and things like that. And so for me, like, the visual culture was about the world, about communities, right? And so all of this I'm getting because I'm seeing this on TV, which is my major point of entry. And then I ended up taking theater and dance classes with these amazing, incredible women who had afros like this. This is my first teaching artist, Pam. I don't know her last name. This is a picture I have that she gave me and a bunch of other kids when we were in her program. I don't know why she gave it to us, but she sits alongside all of my family members. If you come to my house and you look at our bookshelf, she's sitting up there. It's like my mom, my husband's, uh, my in-laws, my husband, and Pam. <laughs> Pam is the teaching artist who impacted me, right? Because she understood what a lot of us don't understand today that the stakes are high, that the arts actually are a place where we could actually intersect beyond the museum walls and within these spaces in the lives of people every day. Um, the center next to, this is actually no longer there, but that's the community center where I grew up going to. So I actually was interested in Pam because I walked up to her one day on the street and I was a shy Pisces little girl, skinny, bony, and I walked up to her and I was like, how do you get your hair like that? Now I grew up, my siblings have afros, I had hair like this but long, and I was like, that's like amazing because she had an afro that you couldn't see through, which was like amazing in the black community. Like the, nothing was thin. And she was like, oh yeah, I'm inspired by Angela Davis. I was like, oh. So I'm this little girl and she, so immediately the arts become connected to politics for me. Style becomes connected to politics for me. That style and politics become connected to the daily lives of people that are under-resourced. All of that. So I didn't see these differences between things. And then when I went to learn more about Angela Davis, when my mom was like, oh yeah, Angela Davis, I'm like, oh, you know who Angela Davis is? And she says, oh yeah, she's like a brainiac. She's a professor. You know, and she would show me these pictures of her speaking to masses of people in Berkeley. 
And I'm like, wow, she's like an order, right? She can talk, she can move people, but she's also strong. And she was also interested in culture. And she saw her clothing as a compelling way to help people understand that this is the point of entry. You can't get here through politics? Well, let me get you here through style, right? And then I just became fascinated with people that had afros. It was crazy. I was just like so engaged in the visual, the coolness, what was amazing. Yes, that's Barbara Streisand. Yes, this little black girl was interested in Barbara Streisand because Barbara had like this soulfulness about her, right? But you look at all these people across, they all had some level of art and culture and social justice connected to who they were. Everyone here. So I was like, to my mom, when, years later, I was like, what is it about? Like, why am I not making all the, why am I making these connections now that I'm older? And it was like a covert thing. And my mom, this is my mom, who's from rural Mississippi, she said, um, she would tell these stories about things that she experienced, like, you know, and every time I would like hear her tell things, I'd be like, God, you know, I wish I was there. I, should, I like long for things that happened before I was born. And she would always say, oh, you had to be there. So she would tell these stories about this performance she went to, this concert with Marvin Gaye and Teddy Pendergrass at the Fillmore in San Francisco. And she would say, oh my God, she and her friends, she wasn't talking to me, I was just in the kitchen. She would tell her, they would reminisce about it, she and Miss Clark and others, and then Miss Clark, uh, one of our neighbors would say, oh yeah, you know, I remember it was amazing. My mom was like, you weren't there the same night we were there. You were there a different night. The night we went, oh, my hair, I, I, I like pressed my hair. I had this beautiful you know, pair of jeans on that were high-waisted. She talked all about the visual. But she also had a conversation with the people in the room about the fact that, oh, my God, you remember we had to rush home afterwards because there was a curfew in San Francisco that year. Again, entering into the realities of the moment. So. My mom would tell me these great stories about you had to be there. And then someone asked me, the one question was, who was your first time? Who did, do you remember the first black artist? Remember the first artist? And I said, J.J. Evans. Then they asked, do you remember the first work of art? It was this, laminated Jesus. And I say laminated Jesus because like this was laminated at a lot of our church events, right? Like it was in a Bible, it was always kind of like, and I knew it was a work of art, though it wasn't in a museum. I didn't think of the Diego Rivera's as works of art. I didn't think about the two-story Benin mural in my community as a work of art. I saw this definitely as a work of art. I saw J.J. Evans as an artist, but I saw this, this must be in a museum. And so, this was in our church growing up, and I have to say, I went to a predominantly black church, actually all black church, and this was white Jesus, you know? There was Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Jesus on the signs, right? And so it's so interesting. Um, so I never saw an image of a black Jesus until I was across the street from our house. There was this place, and it's true. It's called the St. John Coltrane African Orthodox Church. This is a real place in San Francisco, very telling of my upbringing. And so inside of this room becomes probably one of my first triggers that I should be an art historian. You ready? No? Maybe? OK. I'm ready. This is inside. This is John Coltrane as God. This is the mashup of my life. It's music, it's history, it's, it's fine art, it's all of that. And look how monumental they are. And then the musicians are like playing amazing music and I would just look in on my way to my church with laminated white Jesus, which was amazing. We had a great music, great everything, but the images were, the visual images were not anything that looked like me. So I bring all of this up to say that I think museums are these places where we actually underestimate the power of us to be this nexus point just like this. We are 
the last standing, I would say, like places for folks that are, what I would say, Jedis to work. <laughs> This is the place where people actually can come together and actually start to think about what is responsible community development. Meaning, how do we actually be good custodians of each other? How do we actually create these dynamic exchanges? And that we are a place where people want to be, they're coming here. We're one of the most, a recent study says that museums are one of the most top two most trusted places in society. Museums. And so, we are catalysts, we're conveners, we're collaborators. That's how we've been talking about our work at the Met. Like, how do we actually ensure that we're doing these things to bring people together? And so I want to thank you all for really sitting through this, um, for doing the work that you do, for coming to participate in this museum and participate in museums and culture, because we need people to participate in these places because I think that the more people be, are involved in these kinds of environments where discussions can happen in deep ways, the better our society will be. We will hear each other more. We are dealing with really, really challenging times and museums have a stake in the game, I believe. So thank you so much for being here. I know we're out of time, but if there are questions, you tell me if we have time. Oh, microphone, hell, well, I wouldn't even know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Hi, um, my, my name is Sherry Ehrlich, so I'm glad to be here and I enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm currently a professor at Southern, um, but I used to work at the Brooklyn Museum and mm -hmm. I was the teen programs coordinator there. Um, so in 2010, um, along with a colleague, her name is Kiana Hendrick. I know um, Kiana well. <laughs> um, we started a teen night planning committee. And actually, it was um, an idea to get more teens into the museum. And we wanted um, them there in large numbers. So we get a small group of teens, and we said, what would you like to see um, in the museum? What types of programs? And so that group of teenagers um, actually, uh, on that committee was a teenager, his name was Josh Elbay. So he was 14 years old at the time, he was a freshman in high school. Um, and he said, well, why don't we do a model where we have different activities happening in the museum at different times, performances, hands-on art making activities, scavenger hunts. Um, and that model actually became the model for Teens Take the Met. No, it didn't. Which, Hold on. No, 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 no. Because there was something at the Whitney and other places. This has been going on since the 50s. No. Well, well <laughs> in the contemporary time, in the last several yeah, yeah. years, in the large scale, we had 500, 600 teens at mm -hmm. our institution before other institutions decided to take it on. And there was a kind of a little bit of a nervousness. Well, what do we do if we have a large group of adolescents in this museum? Yeah, Who's going to yeah. control it, right? You know? So, um, but the reason why I wanted to bring this up um, about Josh is that he he, he actually um, attended Yale University and graduated from cool. Yale. So um, I just think it's amazing to kind of be here in this space giving a shout out to him who came up with that idea of having those multiple activities um, for teens. And I think that he would be really excited to see how that, um, that's, you know, his uh, idea became a spark and an inspiration that was, mo you know, became a model for other institutions to do some large scale events with teenagers in museums across New York City and then also, um, you know, in other venues um, outside. So I just wanted to, to say that and give a shout out to him. Yes, sir. 
When did you give, when did you give your um, first performance? When you were about three? No, I was very shy. I was a, <laughs> Pis I'm a Pisces. Um, and so, which are known to be shy and then like kind of jump off the cliff and let the ro ground rise up and get them. Um, and so um, it's been a while, <laughs> but not three. Sorry, I have a, a perhaps a slightly more academic question. Good. I'm wondering how um, how you and the Met overall views external organizations like Museum Hack, mm -hmm. who are working on external programming. Um, sure. And like kind of how that fits into everything that we heard about today. Mm -hmm. So actually, when I was at the um, Seattle Art Museum, I um, started a program called My Favorite Things, um, and it's a tour that really is pretty much museum hack. Um, and, um, and other people, I have colleagues that have been doing that kind of thing across um, the country for quite some time. And basically, um, they're dynamically engaging programs. Um, I think if museums had more marketing dollars to tell people about some of the dynamic things that are actually happening, then there wouldn't actually be um, uh, such a, f a frenzy around like, oh my God. There's also like, you know, the um, dolls and something. Like the Met has like 30 of these that people have like decided to like start these at the institution. Um, Museum Hack has gotten a lot of attention. I think it's all great. I think that people should use the museums in ways that actually um, meet their needs and actually bring diverse, con diverse constituency, and by that I mean different interest. Um, I think this notion of like controlling everything is kind of, um, of, of years ago. Um, and so I think people need to use institutions in ways that they see fit. Now, if I happen to walk by something and people are like, oh, Oh my goodness, this is like a negative, I mean, this is, um, this is it's, it's inaccurate information. It's the same as me walking down the streets of Harlem and people are like, you know, yeah, they call the light-skinned people mulattoes. I'm like, no, they don't. You know what I mean? Like, that's like a historical framework and that's a historical narrative, but that's not like contemporary language. And so I think that museums are places that people should use, just like libraries. We were talking about libraries earlier. Like, People seem to know how to use a library. Well, people used to know how to use a library. Um, we kind of need to like bring people back to the space of being able to use places. So we've been talking about instead of people as instead of audiences, how do we actually create users? Um, so I actually think Museum Hack is doing what they should do. Yeah. conversations about race. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of training and preparation you do to mm -hmm. those conversations? Yes. So there are two things. One, I said I believe that museum professionals should come there prepared to talk about these kinds of conversations. So I would not say that everyone is prepared to have these discussions. I have not walked out a single institution where I feel like everyone that should be prepared to have these discussions is. And I also don't think it's the, um, I know you're not saying this, but um, I also want to be clear that it is not the singular responsibility of education, public programming, staff to have these discussions. This actually, these kinds of discussions, if you're working in the cultural sector, should be normative. They should be for folks that have been there for a while who actually are not able to have these discussions or people that have been there for a while and are able to have those discussions. Everyone should be brought up to the same place pedagogically and training wise. And then anyone entering the space um, uh, at beyond a certain date should actually have an understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and teaching practice that's much more holistic. So what we actually have been doing is having workshops with staff and training. We just launched a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, strategic plan at the Met 
that will have everyone participating in training and modular experiences that will be ongoing. It's not an initiative, it's not an effort, it is not a, it, it will be a way of being at this institution moving forward. And it will filter into hiring practice and, and everything. So it's not just on the content side, it's also not just on the audience side either. Um, so there are workshops, activities, um, reading groups, all those kinds of things that we're initiating for those discussions. On my staff, there's also people that um, can go deep and understand the um, approaches um, to addressing certain race and equity issues, but also at the underpinning of that, not just being able to talk about works of art, but understand like what are the real structural, um, what does structural racism have to do with some of these conversations? Like what, what does microaggression look like? Like what is underneath these works of art that play out in this way? So um, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd just like to um, call the name of Art Space mm -hmm. locally. Yes. That's doing some important work in the line of what you've just presented. Mm -hmm. Currently, they have an exhibit called In Plain Sight, mm -hmm. and it, it uh, ends on March 2nd, I believe. There is a huge sheet on which has been printed one of the lynching photographs. And people sit on that bench to rest right in front of that picture. Mm -hmm. And I just can't keep passing it every day without asking people who are sitting there, how do you like that? What do you think when you look at that, you know? Mm -hmm. And some people say, oh, it's nice. <laughs> mm. <laughs> because they haven't looked at it. They mm -hmm. haven't looked mm -hmm. at it. So I don't know what has to happen to make, to make the history as real as it is in our living every day. Mm -hmm. But I am heartened by the efforts of the museums and other art spaces mm -hmm. that are trying to knit the threads of history and bring it all together to make it whole in our lives every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, you are... Um we are, uh, you're hitting on something that I think is really important. We are a poster blind community, mm -hmm. meaning we could move through the world. We're so just trying to get from point A to point B and we are inundated with, so, it's like getting emails. I get so many emails, I'm like, I just can't read them all. I cannot, and so it's like, um, because I also have to check Instagram and I have to check this and I need to do this. You Instagram, what's that movie where the, the woman says, you know, I haven't heard from him because he, I emailed him and he called me and I, I Instagrammed him and he, what is it? He's just not that into you. It's kind of like, but they just kept missing each other, right? It's just like, you know, these, it's like, I, I you link, don't LinkedIn to me, you know? So it's just, it's, but I think we're in a space where people are just like trying to shut some stuff out so they can get some space, like literally just some space. <coughs> but we're also on the, <coughs> we're on, on, a, on the other end of that, there are people who believe that you talk about race is to be racist. Mm -hmm. There's an entire community of people because that was how folks were raised. To even bring it up, to acknowledge race, um, is to say that somebody's different. Well, the truth of the matter is that we are. We're all different, you know? They're, we're complex beings. And what you did is exactly what people should feel empowered to do. Hey, what do you think about that? Just that someone would even care to ask. Oh, it's nice. Really, you think it's nice? Did you look at it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so. But there's so many people who would never do that. 
And so I think that if we can create the museum as a place where people know that's going to happen, that kind of stuff will happen, it kind of becomes welcoming for people to do that, right? People feel a sense of agency. So that's it's pretty powerful. Thank you for sharing that. And our space is really amazing. There's some awesome work happening in this community. Um, and so folks should know that um, because, yeah. All right. Is there is that it? No one else? No? Oh, there's one. Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I'm actually a gallery guide at the museum here, and I was wondering how have you worked, especially with those outside of the education department, such as um, curators and galleries, to encourage um, spaces where visitors can engage with these objects and intersections and conversations when there are no programs happening mm -hmm. in the gallery? Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> a couple of things. I will answer that question, but I was just in Miami um, yesterday doing some work with uh, with some community organizers down there, and it was it was so interesting. I went into this space called the um, the Black House, um, where they're trying to um, buy cult buy up property so that artists and community people can actually have spaces because everything is getting bought up. So a funder flew me and another person down there to kind of consult with them on a collective impact model, because we have a collective impact model with 21 organizations in New York City and one in North Carolina through the Met. So we're down there talking, and I go into this, this shop. It's a print shop, and they sell T-shirts, and they show, but it's a community space called the Black House. And I walk in, and literally every T-shirt has a label. I was like, you better stop this. Amazing! So it's like literally every t-shirt has an image of the source image and wall text, like the date the image was. I was like, this is a daggone gallery. So what we're seeing in that kind of situation is Nike, if you go into a Nike shop, where are the sneakers on pedestals, under vitrines? You go to all these other spaces, so people are taking cues from the museum world. So we actually need to get it right. So what we've been, we actually work with various curatorial departments. We don't always get it right. Um, they don't always get it right. And so a lot of what's happening is that we're thinking of different types of titling. We're looking, and I always tell people, you know, at every institution I've ever worked that people only want me to talk about that institution I'm at at that moment. But there's like all these other places I've worked where like this version of this works and I want to take that and apply it here. I went to this other place and they do this really great. This place titles things well. This, person, this place actually has questions in their wall text. And so in some cases there's like family guides. In other cases there's like really wonderful wall text. Some cases there's you know, um, uh, works of art that are juxtaposed next to each other so that there is a conversation and that's pointed out. Um, I will tell you though that one of, and there's digital stuff and all those things, but one of the challenges is that we're so invested in that tiny bit of real estate Literally, I don't, any of you that have ever worked in a museum, honestly, the conversations that people have about this three by five or four by six piece of real estate, I'm just like, whoa, there's so much other space. So recently, about a year ago, we did stuff with, wall, with floor clings. Um, we, you know, make sure that the guards are informed. I mean, there's just all kinds of other interventions that can happen, but for whatever reason, when we come to these kinds of, dis when I'm in discussions with people, even educators at museums, it's like literally the wall tech, who should write it? I'm like, I don't care who writes it as long as it's good. You know, like, what, you know, who, 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 who owns it, you know? And so it's a really great question, um, what happens when there's no programming there? Um, and those are some of the things that, that happen. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.